Hey, how's it going? I'm going to work on a couple things I'd like to try to figure out and those two things are things that affect the entire world. Well, the first thing we need to talk about is gasoline. What we don't necessarily all know is that the gasoline is taken from crude oil. Crude oil is one of the fossil fuels in the world that has been created over millions of years. So eventually, at the rate we're burning and using gasoline, there'll be no gasoline. What you may not know is in North America, we consume 400 million gallons of gasoline every day. Here in Ontario, Canada, we pay about $5 a gallon for that gasoline. The next thing I'd like to talk about is the amount of pollution that we generate every day, every year, by driving our vehicles. This pollution works out to four to six tons a year from each and every vehicle that's on the road. Pickup truck weighs approximately two tons. A half ton pickup truck, right around two tons. So that pickup truck may generate three times its weight in hydrocarbons and pollutions every year. So these two things, of course, are directly related. We're using up 400 million gallons of fuel in North America every day, and we're generating between four and six tons of pollution with each vehicle every year. What can we do about this? Can we burn less fuel and can we create less pollution? First, we have to understand combustion, right? This is what's happening. This fuel is being burned inside this vehicle. So this is happening through a state of combustion. Well, we need to understand combustion. What is combustion? Well, for many, many years, scientists explained combustion as a fire triangle. They called it a fire triangle because at one point they decided we needed three things. We need heat and we need air or oxygen and we need a fuel. When we started looking into it closer and closer, we found that the heat that was supplied to the fuel had to create a chemical reaction. That chemical reaction has to turn this solid into a gas or this liquid into a gas so it can support combustion. All four of these characteristics have to be exactly right so it changes the state. When I say it changes the state, if we set fire to a solid, right? This is a solid. This is a little piece of log. It's in our fireplace or it's in the backyard in the campground or some other place. This, if this is on fire, if you look at it closely, you'll notice this fire that's burning is not actually touching it. So what that tells us is that that solid, again, through the point of this chemical reaction, is changing its state of matter from a solid to a gas. Solid has to change to a gas to support combustion. What about a liquid? So when I speak of a liquid, we're going to be talking about primarily gasoline. And if we start a liquid on fire, and I'm not telling you to start gas on fire, if we started it on fire on a surface or something that we could look in underneath the flames, we would see that the flames, again, similar to this solid, the flames are not touching the liquid. The actual gas above the liquid is what we see burning. So we learn now that the liquid has changed into a state of gas. Now, let's take a look at the internal combustion engine. We're not going to draw a whole engine. We're just going to concentrate our efforts on a single cylinder. In the 1800s, almost all engines had a little plenum that went up into the air, and they had a carburetor with a lot of very uncomplicated things like a little float bowl, and there was little orifices and needle valves, and it pretty much dumped raw fuel into the cylinder. There's a piston inside a cylinder that has to go through a bunch of motions. Attached to a crankshaft, it travels down and it draws air and the gasoline into this cylinder. So the first thing it does, again, is it travels down. Once it's traveled down, it brings the air in, it brings liquid fuel in, puts it into this combustion chamber, and then it travels back up and it compresses it tight. So the intake stroke travels down, it brings in the air and the fuel mixture, 
Then it goes back up and it compresses that fuel into a tight little area. And then there's another little unit at the top of our cylinder. It's called a spark plug and it creates a spark and ignites our fuel and air mixture. So this little spark ignites this and drives that piston down. So the piston originally came down to draw in air and fuel. It went up to compress and compact everything in the combustion chamber into a tight area. Now it's driving back down. This is the power stroke. So the power stroke drives that piston down. That drives our crankshaft. That drives our transmission. That drives our drive shaft in the rear end or front end or whatever it is that's driving us forward. But it's this explosion that drives that piston down that supplies our power. Now, once that's all happened, we have to get rid of this. So the fourth stroke on our four cycle engine pushes that fuel, that burnt fuel and expired gasoline out through the exhaust system. So this thing has very little time to burn up all of that liquid fuel that's been dumping into this cylinder. Again, this is a carbureted engine that started being manufactured back in the 1800s and was pretty much built right up into the 1980s and 1990s before the automotive people changed their minds. We had, in the 1970s, there became emission standards that came into place and vehicle manufacturing had to start making changes on vehicles. So they had to start introducing something else that would burn a little bit more efficient and they introduced what's called fuel injection. So the fuel injection has the same kind of cylinder. We have the same kind of cylinder on our engine as we had when we were running a carburetor. But now we put it, we're going to introduce a fuel injector that sprays raw fuel into our cylinder. Now that raw fuel comes into the cylinder originally came through into the cylinder into what was called a throttle body fuel injection which meant that that first fuel injector was put right underneath where the carburetor was put into place and we sprayed raw fuel into the top of the plenum and that's where the fuel was introduced into the airstream so the air is traveling inside and the fuel is sprayed on the inside and it drew itself in there again on this intake stroke Right, so intake is going on the way in, the fuel gets the spray, it drops it down inside, and we've still got our same spark plug at the top, and it makes that same spark. Same kind of thing happens, we got a spray of fuel, the spray of fuel goes down into the plenum, and the spark plug ignites it. So now, years after this original throttle body fuel injection was put into place, they changed the positioning of the fuel injector and put it down closer to the cylinder in the intake port. So this was called multi-port fuel injection. This worked a little bit better. It became sequential. This is all timed by an electronic unit inside the car called an ECU. And the efficiencies were increased. They were made quite a bit better. Now, most vehicles have their fuel injector right in the top of the cylinder and that fuel injector on the top of the cylinder is timed. So it sprays that raw fuel in just the right time by, again, the ECU, sprays it into the top of this cylinder. So at the time that the air is being drawn inside, the piston, again, is going down. It's the intake stroke. It's being drawn inside. That little fuel injector gives that little spray, similar to this, right, into the top of that piston. How many times does this happen during the operation of the engine? This fuel that's being sprayed in there in this liquid form, this fuel in this liquid form has to change into something else. It has to change into a gas before it's going to be consumed and burned properly, right? So this liquid is sprayed into the top of that cylinder over 16 times in one second if your vehicle is doing 2000 RPM. So 2000 RPM is a pretty basic revolution per minute going down the road driving on a highway. Doesn't matter what vehicle you're driving, anything at a reasonable speed going down the road, highway, doing the speed limit, you're going 2000 RPM. So at that 2000 RPM, this spray is going into that cylinder to be burned up by that spark plug 
almost 17 times in one second. So what are the odds that all of that liquid fuel that's sprayed in in the form of liquid is burned up and used and turned into a gas for complete combustion? What are the chances that that happens in one second, almost 17 times in one second? We want to burn less fuel, so we've learned that our ECU that's controlling all of the things in our vehicle is spraying this amount of fuel into the top of our cylinder. What if we just take some of that fuel away? What if we reprogram that ECU and make it spray in less fuel? If it's spraying in less fuel, then we should burn less fuel. And that's a good theory, except that because the air is being drawn into the plenum and the intake going into this cylinder, this fuel has to be able to go to the outside edges of the cylinder in order for it to cool and lubricate the cylinder. If it doesn't show up in there, it doesn't spray in there in the right amount to contact the sides of the cylinder walls, then it doesn't cool it and it doesn't lubricate it and we have what's called a overheating engine, this becomes running lean. This causes us mechanical problems. We're putting liquid fuel into our engine, although we know that liquid fuel has to be transformed into a gas for us to establish and maintain complete combustion. Can we change all of this? Can we get away from introducing this liquid fuel into this cylinder and have this air and liquid fuel mixed earlier. What if we turn that liquid fuel into this gas and introduce it all at once into our cylinder for our combustion? And it turns out through design and development and manufacturing and testing that not only do we get far, far better gas mileage? This is almost completely gone. In these pictures, the system is mounted to a 5 liter 8 cylinder engine. This 8 cylinder engine was able to attain 70 miles to the gallon in test procedures on a course of over 300 miles. Here we see the fuel saver mixing tank that is supplied with fuel from the fuel tank of the vehicle that mixes the gas and air into a vapor. By burning this fuel, gasoline, changed from its state of matter as a liquid into a new state of matter as a gas, if we know that we can now drive our vehicles for far less money, we can transport goods, we can travel across the ocean in ships, we can fly in airplanes, we can pump water, plow fields, change everything that we do in the lines of our 400 million gallons per day of fuel consumption. What else can we do with this new gas that we've made from this liquid gasoline? We can do everything that we can do with propane, natural gas, we can use this for heating up torches, for welding, for soldering, and we can also use it for cutting steel. This is a piece of cold rolled steel as demonstrated by this magnet. The same kind of flat bar used in automotive and fabrication applications. This cutting torch is not modified in any way and is originally used for oxygen and acetylene cutting. So if we can use this newfound gas for these new things, what about domestic uses? Can we use it to heat up boilers? Can we use it to boil water? Can we use it in furnaces? Can we use it in our barbecues? Can we cook with it? Can we, can, take, can we take this gasoline, this liquid gasoline, after we've changed it into this new gas, and use it in a more domestic state? Turns out we can. We can use that gasoline 
in a burner and it burns almost perfectly clean. This burner is connected to the fuel saver solely and is supplied fuel through air pressure. The flame is burning blue. This indicates that the system is burning clean and combustion is complete. Here is a confined space air monitor sitting directly beside the gasoline fueled burner. The levels of all dangerous gases are reading zero while being demonstrated in a closed building. Will this kind of thing change the world? We're using 400 million gallons of fuel in North America alone every day. We're creating four to six tons of carbon and pollutions with each vehicle on the face of the planet every year. So the answer to that question is yes. Yes, it can. Thanks for being here. Have a great day.